You ever fought at the Garden? Definitely. What do you like more? I like Vegas more. You do? Yes. That's the best place to fight. No, I like Vegas for tax purposes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true. Of course. New York's the worst, man. What's up, everybody? And welcome to another Boardrooms Out of Office. My name is Rich Kleiman, and I am honored today to sit with the undisputed welterweight champion of the world and pound for pound, the greatest fighter in the world. What's up, Terrence Bud Crawford? What's up with him, man? What's good, bro? Just chilling, man, enjoying this New York weather. I feel you. This New York weather has been miserable, but we happy to have the champ in town, bro. Well, at least it ain't burning hot. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, a lot of people are hyped that you were coming on the show. I told KD yesterday, everybody's talking about you, man. Do you feel, can you feel that? Can you feel like the excitement? And it's been this way, but can you feel it after the fight on the 29th, just this new level of focus and attention? Of course, I, I definitely can feel it, uh, given the fact of all the celebrities that's still talking about it till this day. And the fight was a week and a half ago, and everybody, you know, still saying positive things about it. And when you hear the, the words pound for pound, because I, I would be lying if I said I was like a, ba a boxing fan in the way I'm a hoop fan, but I'm a sports fan. So obviously when there's greatness, I keep up with it and I follow it. But one of the things I've noticed about the sport and maybe one of the reasons why the sport at times disconnected from the layman fan is like all the different belts, all the different classes. Right. And sports fans like to understand exactly what they're watching. But I think everybody knows that the title pound for pound, that's like bigger than any belt bigger than anything and there's no real title for that except for like that's what people call you is that what you as a fighter as great as you ultimately are like fighting for for that title or was it also or as important for you to like let me get all these welterweight belts or let me fight up another class or is it like I want that pound for pound title well coming up I never was like pound for pound that wasn't nothing that I was thinking about or worried about. I was worried about collecting them belts and getting my name in the history books as one of the greatest fighters to ever do it. And the pound for pound just hopped on my table once, you know, I was beating the likes of Gamboa and those type of guys. And Floyd Mayweather has always been pound for pound king when he was uh Boxing, so I'm like, oh man, all right, you know, what I mean, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get there one day. Yeah. And then once my name started getting mentioned uh, in the top pound for pound rankings, then that's when I was like, all right, Floyd retired, Andre Ward retired. There's no doubt about it that I'm pound for pound best fighter in the world. And even though you didn't start your journey trying to get that title, now that you have that title, is it? feel as good as it sounds to the fans is that like the feeling of being the best of the best no nah, I, I think it, it feels good to be recognized as that because you know I always felt as if I was number one pound for pound fighter in the world yeah. I always said it like but I didn't get the credit for it some some had me on they pound for pound list as number one like ESPN they had me as number one but you know, the ring had me as number two. Or so I was top one, top two. Some of them even had me at three. But it wasn't unanimous. So to get everybody recognition now, and it's like, okay, now they they appreciate my, my talent and my skills. Going into the fight on the 29th, it felt like I watched a preview the night before and it was pretty split amongst like the commentators I was listening to about who they thought was going to win the fight and then you really handed it to them. Um, what was your mindset going into the fight? Uh, my mindset was crystal clear and just win the fight. You know, do everything that you said you was going to do. And once that bell ring, make them respect you right out the gate. And that's what, you know, I did and uh, got the victory. You follow any of the pre fight shit or is it too much? No, I do. I do. I I try to keep my ears to a little bit of everything. So after the fight, I can come back and be like, okay, I remember you. I remember you. You know, uh, y'all was doubting me. Y'all was going against me. Y'all said these things about me. Y'all said that about me. 
And, you know, now it's my time to reply to all those things y'all were saying. So you do use it. Like, you know, I, I always, like, I find it funny sometimes when you see some of the things that Steph Curry or Tom Brady or some of the great ones, when they win, they'll talk about, like, a comment that some pointless journalist made. And, and it's like, you hear Brady say it or something, like, this for everyone that thought I fell off the cliff. And it's like, damn, you was really listening to Max Kellerman. Like, that's who said it. But it is. It, it's something that is used i think maybe whether it affected tom brady or not it's like let me grab this material let me put this on the in the mirror every morning to remind myself that's what people are saying but like really it's just max kellerman talking but is that what you need to do for motivation at times you have to like build that storyline up and get a little bit of the material that people are saying to continue to like motivate yourself every time you're in the gym well i'm always motivated that's 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 not a, a issue but that just put a little extra fire on the motivation yeah. that I got inside of me to to see the people that don't know me that's saying things that they don't know about me that they heard from like a person in the media or, and they just take it and run with it and then hearing people in the media say certain things and uh, about me that that they don't know. And it just just spark a flame in me, like okay, I'm gonna prove y'all wrong because you know this is not a team sport. Yeah. I, I'm in control of this. I'm the one that's fighting. I'm the one that's in control of my destiny. So y'all can't help them. Y'all yeah. can't call a timeout for them. Y'all can't interfere. Y'all can say what all y'all want, but once that bell rings, it's just gonna be me and that guy. <laughs> And uh, I just use that as extra motivation because I've been told I couldn't do a lot of things in life. And I always overcame them with, with you know, hard work and dedication. When you stood up on the uh, ropes and started calling out dude in the crowd the other night, amazing moment. How premeditated was that? Or was it just in the heat of the moment? It definitely was the heat of the moment. It's crazy because a lot of people like, man, how did you manage to find Charlo? When I was coming out, when I was coming into the ring, you know, he was just like, his eyes was just locked on me. And it's like, nobody was there and all I seen was him. And so I walked and I looked at him. He looking at me like this. And I was just like, man, I'm not even gonna worry about that dude. Like focus on what's in front of me. And then once I got that uh, knockdown, you know, uh, it wasn't nothing, but I was feeling that the rage that was in me. And then the second one, I went over there and I said something to him. And the third one, I said something to him. And then after the fight, I was like, yeah. And I looked at him like, you next, like, you know. And he applauded me, he was like, it was like, congratulations. I was like, all right, thanks. You know what I mean? Cause it's kind of like, always been fighting for that recognition. Yeah, Always been fighting for my just due because I didn't have the backing like everybody else. I didn't have the the media push like all these other fighters that's name is, you know, um, bigger than mine, but I've accomplished way more than theirs. Uh, so, you know, that's all I, you know, wanted was my, my respect and, and you know, uh, that was it. Do you ever have a chance to like, after a fight like that to think about fighting for $600 when you start your career and then to be like a unanimous welterweight champion on top of the world. And can you step out sometimes to just be like, damn, like when you're back in Omaha, just, just kind of remind yourself of how far you came because you haven't lost a fight. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think sometimes when you're chasing, I know it's this way in business too. It's this way in life. Like you're chasing, chasing, chasing. And I do think the journey is more fun. I think we all feel like the journey ultimately is more fun. I mean, I remember being with KD minutes after each championship and I could see in his eyes, like the journey is more fun. You know, the journey is the feeling, but I do think it's important at times to just be like, damn, like I'm nice. <laughs> Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I haven't lost. Like, I'm I'm that guy from Omaha, Nebraska. Do you have a chance to ever allow yourself to feel that? Yeah, definitely. I, I always felt that I was the best, you know. But, you know, uh, a lot of people always ask me, 
why I haven't moved and why I still, you know, be in the same neighborhood that I grew up in and don't move, move out, you know, into a, a nicer neighborhood. And I'm just like, well, this is the neighborhood that, that molded me into the guy that I am. And this is where it all began. And I think that's what keeps me level-headed and it keeps me grounded because, you know, a, a lot of people can get caught up in the fame and the hype and, and whatnot, and they can change. And then, you know, they can lose it all because boxing only lasts for so long. Yeah. And after that, you know, it's over with. Now, you know, people are going to look at you for who you really are, are and not what you once did. I never want to be one of those fighters that have all the limelight, have all these people chasing them. And uh, you see them now, they didn't get a life to the sport. They they got, you know, brain damage. They, they talking with slurs and, you know, it's hard to see them. And then you look at the crowd and you look at the people, nobody's noticing them. They noticing the next yeah. star, you know, and I've, never want to be like them or you know you see them they don't they don't have nothing to show for it really mm -hmm. you know but the damage that they accumulated from taking all those headshots so yeah i'm just like man i never want i just want to be me who what you see is what you get i never want to be anybody else and the balance of going home probably like soon as you get off that plane is a reminder where you came from but i would also probably assume that it being Omaha, Nebraska also plays a part in it, right? Because a lot of times you hear people work their whole life to get out of where they grew up and they want to give back to where mm -hmm. they're from. They want to help and rebuild, but they, they're not trying to live there. They're not trying to deal with the distractions. Um, but you don't have that back home. It feels like that's where your safe haven is, right? Yeah, no, I, that's, that's definitely what I'm destined to do. You know, is give back to my community. You know, I invest in my community. I have a gym in my community, and you know, I'm easy to to be seen in my community. So, like, my community is everything because growing up, I know the type of things that I was getting into, the type of things that I was doing, and uh, I know the younger generation is worse. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, there's a lot of young mothers to having children that really shouldn't be having children and they don't have no no inspiration you know father figure type of guy to look up to to walk that uh straight at narrow you know so it's like how can i get back mm -hmm. you know i don't necessarily feel that i need to do things for people just to put on Instagram to show people that I'm doing things. So I get a lot of, oh, what are you doing for the community? And people always say, well, he got a gym that's free. You know, he, 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 your kid can go down there and don't have to pay a dime to enter his gym and to work out and to do this and do that. And you don't have to pay for nothing. But there's way more that I do in the community that I don't, you know, talk about because you know, if I do something for this kid, I'm doing it out the kindness of my heart. I'm not doing it just to show that I'm doing it. So I don't have to get on social media and say, hey, look, I bought, th I bought this kid some shoes because he has holes in his shoes and I want everybody to pat my back. Yeah, I don't do that. When I do things for people, you know, they know who they are and we just keep it moving. It's crazy because that's how it should be, right? But it's like rare to hear that because... I think now, if it doesn't exist on social media, it doesn't exist to right. some people. But the academy you built, I was reading about some of the things that these kids get out of it. And it isn't just about boxing, which is amazing. It's like, you know, boxing's the backdrop, right? Boxing is the the anchor, but it's a chance for them all to, to dream and grow and realize there's more. And I think that's really what it is, right? Just like the opportunity for more, know that there's more. And coming from Omaha, Nebraska, like you've shown the world there that there's more like the business of being a boxer outside of the sport. Have you evolved in how it, how much focus you want to give that or what's important outside the ring for you? Or do you 
always just rely on like if I do my job in the ring, the money will be right, it'll work out? Or do you do you see that as part of what it means to be the champ? Like all those other things off and out of the ring? No, that one hundred percent. You know, I was I once was that guy that, you know, let me let me take this and just do my job. Let me sign this contract and get this guarantee. But once you get older and once you start no, noticing that you in control of your own destiny, you in control of your own business, you got to start thinking business-wise. Okay, so let me see the contracts. Let me sign the contracts. Let me see what's really coming in. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like us boxers, we get the short end of the stick every single time we step foot in the ring if we not in control of our our own career you know i took a step out of you know leaving my promotional company and being my own boss a lot of people say they're their own boss but i got a great team around me that you know help me and make sure that i'm great in all avenues you know uh, and it's very critical for fighters to know what's on the table mm-hmm. because a lot of us we uh, we'll take a five million dollar guarantee not knowing there's 30 million dollars coming you know in. What i mean that yeah. that we missed not coming in that we missed that we should have we should have got other revenue that could yeah. have generated given given the circumstances that we might fight it fight a top fighter yeah you know when two fighter top fighters fight you know you got the promoter they sucking up all the money, you know, the advisors, the managers, you know, everybody, the the sanction bodies, you know, everybody taking a little piece out of this pot. That's really the fighters, and but the fighters don't know because they satisfy with the guarantee. Yeah. So uh, I think it's very critical that these fighters, you know, start learning learning the business, and the more they learn, the more they gonna, you know. Uh, stop all the the uh, corruption that's happening in boxing cuz boxing is one of the most corrupted sports there is and never been in the history of sports that's what i was going to ask you like as a as a fan i'm watching this and it's there's different sanctioning committees there's different governing bodies some are regulated here some regulated here it must be overwhelming for the boxers, or is it not? Is it something you just accept that this is what the sport of boxing is like? Or is there a feeling maybe amongst some of the like marquee fighters that there could be something to do to change this? Like, what is WBC, WBA, IBF? All of these have their own regulations, their own governance, right? And then there's promoters involved that I'm sure operate in their own way and political relationships that run deep. Is it... Can it be overwhelming for a younger fighter a bit? He don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They sign that contract and they let they 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 promotion no company handle that and they manager handle that. You know, and they don't know. You know, I was I was a victim of that. I didn't know what I know now. I never knew, you know, coming back up cuz I wasn't I wasn't able to see anything. I wasn't able to question anything. Because I signed a contract stating that these is my guarantees, these is my numbers going up. Yeah, you know, so uh, I wasn't I wasn't able to say, okay, well, what's coming in? Yeah, or you know, how much you getting for sponsorships, or how much you giving for the event? I mean, the event budget and stuff like that. I wasn't I wasn't able to ask those type of questions, but once I started asking those type of questions or, you know, started learning a little bit here and there, then it became a problem Yeah. between me and my old promoter. And at that point in time, I knew it was time to go. I bet you those older promoters, that's like the business. Like, let me pull the wool over their eyes till they find out. Then when they find out, it is what it is. Well, they all do it. I won't just say, you know, my old promoter, they all do it. That's what I'm saying. All the, all the old school promoters, right? Or promoters, period. All of them. It's meant to uh, keep the keep the fighter blind, keep the fighter, you know, in a, in a place where he's not asking questions, you know, he's not he's not looking for anything. Here, let me give you this little guarantee and show up, and you be on your way. But at the same time, 
it's so much more on the table that that's that that the fighter is really obligated to that he never even see because he signed a guarantee not knowing there's much more to come from. Are there no OGs in the game that when you was coming up with the arm rounds, you was like, man, check them contracts, or that's not the spirit of it? <laughs> no, not at all. Some of them don't even know. They don't know either. Like, some of them that's don't crazy. even know to have because they've been dealing with that their whole career that they think is normal. So the things that they do know and that they do hit the little uh, fighter on the hand, like, hey, listen, you got to watch out for this. You got to watch out for that. You know, that's that's small things. Yeah. You know, like, you got to get incorporated. Like, Tim Bradley definitely, you know, put me on game about getting incorporated and, you know, things like that and the things that I need to uh, ask for and stuff like that. So he definitely looked out for me uh, a lot. But, like, you know, Floyd, he, he broke the bank, you know, and I don't see him trying to – you know, uh, give the game to the young fighters because he's a promoter now. Yeah. So I can't I can't give everybody the game. Yeah. If 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 I'm one of them now, it's a business at the end of the day. So uh, if if they made all this money, you know, on the, on our backs as fighters, and now I'm a promoter, I'm gonna do the same thing that they once was doing. And just say it's just the game of the it's business. It's the game. Yeah. <laughs> Do um, like how important and and what is the makeup of a team for boxers? Because there's no union, right? There's no union for no boxers. Union. So what's the typical like infrastructure around a fighter? I would say a fighter. You know, you need to have a great lawyer. You know, overall that knows what he's doing that season. That's been around the block. That you know, um, no, wait. no, yeah. I wouldn't even say wait, just not no pushover because you got to understand all of these, you know, uh, promoters like Don King and Bob Arum, they lawyers, <laughs> you know what I mean? First. They lawyers. And if they not lawyers, they got some of the baddest lawyers around them, you know, so they can give you those type of contracts where they protect and they sell, but they confusing you at the same time so you can sell your soul. And uh, yeah, man, you get you get you a good advisor, get you a great coach, you know, and you'll be on your way, you know. But most importantly, you need, you know, great people around you that want the best for you. So lawyer, advisor, manager, and, and the trainer, right? Well, re really, you can just, you and the lawyer. It can just be you and the lawyer. You know, and you can go. The sky is the limit, because now nothing can get away. Uh, nothing can get by you. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. You can that's walk it. in the room, you know, and you can pick any coach you want, as long as you got the business right. Got the business right. You know, once once the business right, you you sky is the limit. You know? So when you win a fight like you did the other night. Is it you look at your team like it's time like now y'all gotta step up one more notch too? No, they my I got a top tier team. No. <laughs> well, I'm just so I like to think I'm top tier too. But after KD won his chip, he looked at me like, now what, brother? Like let's go, let's let's bring more in. No, but listen, we I looked at my team. My team looked at me, and we we said we was gonna get that fight. That was something that you know uh, was was yearning for five years. You know, and we're going to get that fight. They looked at me, we're going to get that fight. We're going to get this shit done. That's dope. You know, and I sat back and I was like, all right, I believe them. You know, so I was confident that the fight was going to happen. 100% confident. And, you know, I don't look at them like, now what? You know, uh, I just, hey, we, we in we the moment. It. Yeah, we did it. We in the moment and, you know, they trust me as well as I trust them, and we're going to take it for as far as it go. What's the, like, lead up to a fight that, that big for you, training-wise? Oh, man. The lead up was, was just training. 
Do you, you know, start we, like a certain amount of months before with a certain level of training ramp up for that fight? Yeah, I had a I had a pre camp. This was the first time I ever had a pre camp. So I had a pre camp before my training camp. So uh, yeah, it was tough. It was tough, and uh, yeah, like you going through all this marketing stuff with your team, you're going through all this promotional stuff with your team, and. You know, everything was strategic, you know, from, you know, me training to the to the media, to everything. Everything was, you know, strategic. And I got to give credit to to my team for all that. Are you, and do you do this in, in back in Omaha or do you get out of town to train? I, I train in Colorado Springs, but I went to Vegas first. Got it. And how do you balance? Because, you know, I've seen and read how much of a family man you are and how important that is and how involved you are and how present you are. And obviously that's, you know, the most respectable quality, but how is that tough to balance um, when you got to get into fight mode? Like the family knows like, all right, he's going in the phone booth now. No, not at all. I bounce back and forth. You know, <laughs> you know, You're talking I, a minute night training during the day. No, nah, when I say bounce back and forth, it's like my niece, she had a graduation. I had a, I had a child like, you know, uh, my son's birthday, he came, uh, stayed with me for like two weeks, him, my boys. So it's like, I'm bouncing back and forth. Got it. You know, and a lot of people are like, hey man, you training? I'm like, man, listen, training is cool, but they priority first. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think those times that I was away, like a day or two days, you know, helped me more than hurting me because I'm training so hard and I never really let my body, you know, rest. So those little days that I was able to get, you know, some rest was critical. Yeah. What um I, I noticed, you know, obviously Eminem walked in with you to the fight. You had um, BBC on your back, Pharrell's BBC. Um, grew up 80s, 90s. How much did, like, the explosion of hip hop culture during that time impact you and you know how much of um i guess the influence of hip hop culture do you see in terms of your style in terms of how you approach your business and like when you make a move like that with Eminem what is the background on that how does something like that come about and is that is that something you see as like let me make a moment right here this is like this is a show let me put on a show or is there more to that Man, I love music, man. I'm probably one that don't even have a, a, a I would say, a style but of music that I listen to because I listen to all different mm -hmm. uh, levels of music. And uh, business-wise, I don't look at music as, as anything to do with business. But the way the Eminem thing happened was 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 I would say it was greatness you know uh, everybody was just like what you coming out to what you coming out to everybody always asking me what you coming out to if you can look at the history of um, all the songs that I walked out to it kind of has some meaning towards it behind it for that for that fight and I always say the song pick me I don't pick the song you know, I'll be in the gym and I'll be listening to all different type of music. And one song might play and i just be like, boom, there it go. Like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Like, just hit me. And, uh, the Eminem came about. I wanted to do uh, Drop the World on Your Head by Eminem and Lil Wayne. But for whatever reason, that didn't uh, come to fruition. And I was just like, man, I don't think Eminem ever walked nobody out, you know, and he really don't come outside. Never. And I was just like, man, that'd be dope if Eminem walked me out, you know, because I was just thinking of not only a, a star to bring me out, I wanted the icon, yeah. you know, and I was just like, man, you think Eminem, you know what I mean? What you think about Eminem? Me and Shakur, and he was just like, man, that'd be dope. You know, and Eminem comment on the on the uh, Instagram. I never knew he was a fan of boxing because you never hear nothing about him. So I was just like, Dang, that's 
That's dope. It was exciting. It was it was a great moment, and I think everything lined up for for history and greatness to be witnessed that night. And him being there was a testimony to how great I'm, I'm, I really am. Yeah, that's right. That's dope. Um, Creed three. Did you enjoy that? Loved it. Loved it. It was dope. You know, I I told Michael B. Jordan. I said, man, to see him in his element doing all the directors directing and uh acting at the same time i said man i ain't seen nothing like that ever before you know it was it was it was crazy to see him and in one mode then see him in another mode then see him in another mode so he had the regular mode where he just like yeah yeah you know what i mean we gonna do this and we i just, I just want you to do this and then he had another mode where it's acting and then he got another <laughs> mode where he directing like, no, nah, we can't do this. We can't do that. We got to do this like this. Let's change it up. Y'all get on set. And I'm like, this dude so talented. That's crazy. You know what I mean? It's It was crazy. So you saw all three hats that he's wearing. Yeah. You want to be around film again? Yeah, that's dope. I, I would love to be around, around film again. So when you look now at the future for you. Um, and let me ask you a question, and probably a stupid question, but um, as someone that's not native to boxing every day, how much is the weight disparity a real thing? Like when I was reading about you and Tank, right? And the different weight classes, but the chances of potentially fighting one day. Like as boxers, is the weight difference really like a, as, as, uh, as much of an obstacle from a fight happening as it is just like the way it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, would that really make a difference? The Definitely. way it would? Definitely. It does. You know, Tank fight at 135 pounds. I fight at 147 pounds. So that's two weight classes apart. You know, that's a big gap. That's a big gap, you know, given the size advantage that I will have over him. You know, he's a little dude too. He probably like 5'5". Five, five. You know, I'm 5'8". Uh, long arms, so I'm, I'm. It wouldn't be an idea mount, match up for him, but yeah. I would. I would definitely You're down. I would definitely walk on. And what about going? You guys could. He could go up. You could go down a bit, right? That's how. I'm that no. You're not. Go, you're not going down at all. <laughs> at all. Never. I'm going up. So you want to go up, down. and he'd have to go up to meet yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. So is there a next weight class you want to fight at? 154 pounds. And what belt is that? That's the junior middleweight. Junior middleweight. Yeah. So is that your next fight? I don't know. I don't know. Everybody uh, want to know Terrence's next fight, but Terrence don't even know. Terrence don't know. Why does everyone call you Bud? Uh, my mom named me that when I was probably like one. She just was and it stuck. named me Bud. Good nickname is good, yeah. though. Because everybody thought I named I was like, oh, my mom gave me that name. You know, I don't know why. And so I said, Mom, how you get Bud out of Terrence? And she was like, oh, so Somebody was calling you Spud. They just kept calling you Spud. I'm like, don't call my son Spud. Call him Bud. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right. Nicknames don't always have the uh, the the backgrounds for meaning. It just happens, right? right? Then it yeah. sticks. And then 35 years later, you turns Bud Crawford. Definitely. Um, the promotion side of your business, uh, and and when you switch that over, do you have time in your calendar and your routine to like? flip business mind and look at other fights that your promotions company is going to put together and then turn back into Terrence the fighter or it's just similar to family you manage it all no yeah for sure definitely when I take that step to you know sign step to go go out and sign fighters I would definitely you know uh, make that switch but right now you know I'm I'm focused on myself you know, I don't want to be focused on too many things at once, but most definitely I got an eye out and watching the up and coming fighters and, you know, uh, fighters with the talent to to go places in, uh, in the future. And not only, you know, for them to be signed to TBC promotions, but for me to guide them and let them know that there's more to to, to the sport, to the game. Like you said, be an OG to let them know 
you know, the game and show them the way and, you know, uh, put everything on the table. That way they know that they're not getting misused or abused. And uh, I think that would be the start of changing the game up. Yeah, well, that's interesting because, as you mentioned with Floyd, it's like it, it is just business, as you said. But the idea that part of what your business is is giving these boxers a bit more visibility is dope. Right. That's like what you see happening in the record business. And, you know, people just have looking at the way these things or things have been and realizing like they don't have to be like that. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how it's been. Like the boxer didn't get the fair share, but you know, someone like you has the ability to change that. Yeah, it's definitely like the record business. When you when you think about it, you know, a lot of those rap rappers, they work they they ass off to, you know, build them type of masterpieces that they build, but they don't own it. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So it's kinda like us fighters. Yeah. We, we we fight our ass off, but we don't own our fights. The promotional company own our fights, and they got the right to say what they're going to do with it and what they're not going to do with it. And they can go and sell sell your fights for hundreds of millions of dollars and don't have to give you a cent. Yeah. So that's just one avenue. Uh, but, yeah. I think that will clean up boxing a lot. Well, and it's also, it has to be a fighter to to do that because it's like the same analogy in the music businesses until Jay-Z and others started rapping about buying their masters back and people started going independent and making, a, you know, a point of saying how wrong some of the economics are and then no one really paid attention. Now you have businesses being built in lieu of major labels, you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. it's not replacing them, but there's other opportunities. And I think it's dope that you have the opportunity to be that promotions company that's like, hold up, you could see the books too. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, that 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 goes back to when I said you got to have a, a great lawyer that's seasoned. Because if you got a great lawyer that's seasoned, he's not going to let you sign a contract where you don't have those things. You know, so, uh, yeah. Like. Uh, well, a great lawyer also who is only thinking about the fighter. Yeah. You can have a great lawyer who's right thinking about everybody. And it's not the bright lawyer for the fighter. but For sure. But if he on your team and, he, and he's riding for you and want to see, you know, you succeed and you be the best that you can be, it, it only benefit him. Yeah. You know, uh, there's enough money for everybody. Yeah, I think when 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 greed get into uh, the playing field, then that's when you see lawyers start being shady because they try to get something under the table, yeah. or you start seeing managers being shady and advisors being shady, and some some coaches, some coaches even shady, you know. So uh, you gotta you gotta watch out for yeah. for everybody because money make people you know do things that you would have never thought they would do, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it's the root of all evil. This might be a weird question to ask someone who's never lost, but even in a, in a victory, you take punches and it's, it, even training is wearing on you. And you mentioned earlier in the interview about some of these fighters who you see them now, and it's tragic to see physically, you know, the effect that it had on them. How conscious are you year to year about where you are physically and like how long you want to go? Oh yeah, man. I'm very conscious. Like I just did a, a CAT scan. I did a whole body analogy, you know, before this fight, you know, and uh, I'm very aware of that. And I be on top of it because I never wanted to be the type of person that let boxing retire me. I always said I wanted to retire from boxing, you know, um, uh, my goal was always 33. I'm about to be 36 next month. So You're not I'm, ready. So I'm three years past past time, you know. And the only reason why is because of the Errol Spence fight. Mm. I always told everybody that that was the fight that I really wanted. That was the fight that, you know, when I walk in the store, you know, people ask me, is you going to fight that Errol Spence dude? I can't wait till you fight him. When I go home, my kids 
looking on YouTube and they looking on <laughs> Terrence Crawford, they father, they seeing Errol Spence. Damn, is you gonna ever fight that dude, Spencer? I'm like, who is Spencer? That Spencer dude, uh, Spence. Spence, and yes, yeah. I am, son. Yeah, we gonna fight one day. Oh, all right, cause they 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 talking about he gonna beat you up, and I'm like, not my dad. So I gotta hear it not only outside of my home, but inside of my home as well. So I knew that was a fight that needed to happen, and it happened. And you know, so what now? What do you have to fight for then? We're going we're gonna to see what the future holds. So it could be it could be over. Could be. Maybe. Maybe not. But you popping right now. It can't be over. Right. Can't be over. Right. You ever fought at the Garden? Definitely. What do you like more? I like Vegas more. You do? Yes. Vegas is the shit. Yeah. Definitely. That's the best place to fight. No, I like Vegas for tax purposes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's true. Of course. New York's the worst, man. <laughs> yeah, New York tax me. They tax me every time I fought in the garden. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. crazy. You're right, of course. Yeah. Well, man, it's been a pleasure getting to know you, brother. Congratulations. Pound for pound, the greatest fighter in the world. Sounds good. I'm honored to have had you on boardroom in the office and excited to watch what the future holds, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having appreciate. me. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, download, join. Speak to you all soon.